April C. Taylor, that's my name. I am 45 years old. I don't have any children. I've been dancing for 40 years. I started dancing when I was, I think, four going on five. Um, and it was a wonderful, it's been a wonderful journey. And at times it's been very, very challenging um, because I'm not skinny. And I really never was. Um, but I wanted to dance more than anything else. So I did everything you do. I starved myself. I've got compulsive overeating problems. <laughs> I had anorexia <laughs> for a minute in high school. And I don't mean to trivialize any of the eating disorders. And if anyone you know or yourself is, is working through those issues, I certainly want you to get help. Because it's no, it's no way to live. In that vein, I am not a psychologist. So if that is something that anybody is working with, through, and needs support, I really hope that you'll ask myself or Dana or any of the other teachers to get support. And that means you or anyone you know. Because it's, it's a horrible place to be. And I know it because I was there. Okay? Um, these workshops, I just want you to love being you. And... Ultimately, I want you to love being you so much that everybody that comes near you loves themselves because of the reflection part, right? The Mayans have a wonderful phrase. It's called in Lakesh. I-N-L-A-K-E-S-H. In Lakesh. It means I am another you. And I love that. Because it means that, we're, there, that there, there's nothing wrong with me, right? There's nothing that needs to change or be fixed or be different, unless I want it to be. You still get to be you in your body with your boundaries, with your edges, with your soreness, with your headaches. But you also get to really revel in being a part of a big human family soup. And I think that that's a really important thing, especially now. You guys know what's being said. Separate, separate, keep away, separate, different than me, different, different. So I want to, I want to sing the story, sing the song of, of oneness. And I know that's very hippy-dippy. I get it. But I'm kind of hippy-dippy, so it makes sense. Um, it was in college when I met Dana, that I really got to a place of, okay, this is enough. I'm going to dance, you know, damn the torpedoes of, of what normal dance world says. I'm going to do this. And I started working on many different avenues. And expressive arts was really the sort of door for me. Because like I said at the beginning, it allowed me to have all my creative process without being sort of beleaguered by the mirror, which had become as much an enemy as anything. And it allowed me to sort of break into the other ways I could express through my body without having to think all the time, are my, is, my, is my belly flat enough? My boobs are so big. You know, I've gained five pounds. I've lost 25 pounds. I gained and lost in my teens and 20s over 100 pounds. That's just hard. It's hard on the body. It's hard. It was hard on my heart and my mind. I suffered. I suffered with everything I ate. I judged myself and I compared myself to everyone else in the room. So trust me, like when we did that walk at the beginning, I have done all of that. And the sole purpose of my creating this work, this dance for all, which is what I'm kind of calling it, where I work with very young children, and I hopefully will get to work through all the way up to, into adults and, and, and older people too, is just allowing for my body and your body and all of our bodies to be who they are, however they are. And yes, dance is an art form, and there are certain things that we want to strive to do well, to do better, to do more strongly, more accurately, that's always going to be in dance, and I want it to be there because it's gorgeous. We all know. We all know how exquisite it is, yeah? I just want to open up the conversation 
to allow for everyone to feel confident and comfortable in this space. Um, I like to think as, of movement as medicine. I like to think of movement as a healing practice, dance as a healer, and not just dance as an art form. Uh, and that allows for all movement to be honored and all bodies to be accepted and valued. Because as you know, those of you who've danced a long time, we've stood looking at ourselves in relationship to other people, and that can get really tough, right? The, this idea that the leg, her leg is higher, he can turn more, right? Look at her feet. Look at his arm. Look at the height of his, you know, the men, they get to like fly through the air with the greatest of bees, right? So that's the part that I, I want to, I want to turn away from the mirror and turn the mirror maybe inward so that each of us can feel really good about our dancing selves. Because I want to dance forever, right? Do you really want to stop dancing at 32? Because somehow that's the end? I, I don't. And I love that, you know, ballet dancers are so strong and so hardy until they're 25, 26, and then they become ballet mistresses and they run ballet companies and they open schools. What makes me sad, though, is when I hear that those dancers don't dance anymore because they, they're too old, right? You know, Martha said it. Like, that quote is like, when I read that for the first time in high school, I was like, oh, my God. Like, that's it. There's only one of each of us in any given moment. And I don't want us all to be the same. We would, lack, we, we, we would lack all the facets, right? When you have a gemstone, they sparkle, why? Because there's so many edges to them, there's so many facets, that's what that means. It's the little corners on a gemstone that make them shine so brilliantly. I want each of us to be our own gemstone, multifaceted, and then look what happens when we all get together. Look at the jewelry box for a good analogy I like to use a lot, right? So I think those are some of the really important things to think about. There's a concept in psychology, again, for those of you who've had some psych, you might have heard of this. It's called the shadow. And the shadow is this tricky part of ourselves that kind of like gets up underneath our skin and maybe makes us act and react in ways that we aren't even conscious of. It's that little part of you that may go, look what she's eating. I would never eat that. Right? And then there's this sense of righteousness. And the shadow grows bigger and bigger. Right? So checking yourself on where your shadows may lie. Because they're tricky. They, they dwell right outside of ability to be seen. The minute you turn and look, shadow disappears. It's the negative self-talk. It's the way you judge other people with the way you think and feel. And shadow grows and grows, right? You could see how shadow in a culture would be really damaging. Do, do we have shadows in our culture that oppress people, right? That make people lesser than? That make people afraid to be who they are? Yeah? If we don't talk about these shadows, well, we know what happens. We, we, have, we have history to show us. So I, that's a big piece for me. It starts with each one of us acknowledging our own personal shadow, our own darkness, and our own light. The shadow will never go away. You can't get rid of it. One of the things I learned in my process in my work was you spend the first 40 years of your life denying your shadow is there and the next 40 years of your life, if you're lucky, learning how to live with it. Right? 
So my gift to you in your 20s, get to know your shadows now, make friends, recognize when they take over and you do crappy stuff to other people or yourself, thank your shadow, because your shadow is hiding a wound. Your shadow is oftentimes hiding a deep down, deep inside you core wound that was probably given to you when you were very young, maybe even before you could talk, because we were raised by imperfect people. Yep. And whether they wanted to or not, they hurt us. And so the, the wound is made in deep in young childhood, and the shadow and all the protection builds up over time. And it causes you to pull away from yourself. The wound may be too painful to look at, <coughs> right? But there's a wonderful silver lining in the wound. And I'm living proof. It often, if you can find it and love it and let it out and let the shadow know that you can take care of yourself, you don't need shadow's negative energy to protect you anymore. Your greatest purpose will show up. It happens over and over again. The thing that hurts you the most can be the thing that fuels your life. I'm living proof. I was terrible to myself as a young person. I was awful. I hated my body because I wasn't a dancer like everybody else. And I, oh, I was cruel. Oh, I was so, so mean. Dana told me a long time ago, she goes, treat your body like it's your best friend. And I was like, I have been a terrible friend, right? But it's given me my purpose. Like, I know why I'm here. I know why I've been put on this earth to do this work, to heal in a, in a cultural way, in my own small drop, the body wound that I think we're all holding, the, the wound of loathing, the wound of deprivation, the wound of injury, the wound of illness, the wound of cruelty, the wound of abuse. I'm here to help heal that. And if I were 5 feet 11 and 122 pounds, I don't know that my message would be quite as effective. So despite it all, <laughs> 211 pounds of me, I get to stand up and say, enough, heal, Love, accept, create, and don't stop. Be a lighthouse for other people. Shine your light out so that others will come to you and will also be healed. The earth needs healing. Our families need healing. Our bodies need healing. Right? Can you see how it goes all the way out and comes all the way back like breath, like the ocean? Yes? All the way out and all the way back. That's the gift. Purpose from the wound by acknowledging the shadow, cultivating your light. Yeah. Hmm. I am another you in Lakesh.